I just want to give a welcome everybody. It's really nice to see you, even even virtually. And I'm so glad that you're here today. Um, we I want to give a little bit of context because I know some of you are familiar, but some may not be with an organization called ACUE, A-C-U-E, which stands for the Association of College and University Educators. And basically it's a nonprofit support organization that provides professional development for higher ed professionals. And they're focused specifically on pedagogical topics. So they offer professional development courses on things like effective teaching practices. And for quite a while now, I've actually been following their work and hoping in years that LaGuardia would be able to do some work with them because their materials are really interesting and I think very well designed and very helpful for faculty. So this is one silver lining of the pandemic. Um, last fall, CUNY said to us, hey, we're going to support some of the community colleges and actually give you some funding so that your faculty can take some professional development training with AQ, specifically around teaching online. And they gave us the option to pick a couple of their topics. Um, and we picked active learning and inclusive pedagogies. Um, we have three sections of faculty who successfully, uh, and about 60 faculty, LaGuardia faculty successfully completed their AQ micro-credential. If they take one course, you get a micro-credential. Um, if you're able to keep going and you can take three more, then you get an actual credential credential. Um, and hopefully, maybe somehow in the future, we can, um, we can work on getting that for LaGuardia faculty. But meanwhile, we were able to take advantage of this really wonderful opportunity. And we had three local faculty facilitators. So although AQ develops their own materials and the professional development courses that they share are you know, based on their model, we locally had three of our wonderful faculty facilitators who are going to lead us in today's session, share a little bit about what they learn and how you might be able to apply some of the AQ principles in your work with your students. We hope that um, this will be a good chance for you to use some of that information for your own work. So we have um, Allison Sheffield and Nitu Kashik. Allison is from natural science, for those of you who don't know her, and Nietzsche is from social science. And they both led faculty cohort um, session, sections on active learning. And then Jen Arroyo from business and technology led the inclusive pedagogy section. And I'm gonna hand it over to them so they can tell you more about the AQ approach and also what we'll be doing today. Zoom. Can everybody see the first slide? Yes. Okay, which is basically a recap of everything that Priscilla just said. <laughs> so why don't we go to the first slide? Oops. Our agenda. So actually what Priscilla just welcomed us with, that was our introduction and we're gonna say more. So the acronym that she mentioned, AQ, that's this A-C-U-E. There were six takeaways that myself, Nitu, and Jennifer identified, and we're going to talk just for a few minutes, you know, four or five minutes about each one, and, you know, what we thought were the most interesting strategies, and, you know, throughout the facilitating, you know, a lot of the participants were able to use some of the strategies during that semester, so we have a little bit of insight as to which, um, which tips were already used and implemented successfully. 
So then we'll break you into different rooms to, with some discussion points, and then we'll just share everything together and leave some time for Q&A. So I think, why don't we just move on to the first takeaway point, and that is on pre-work for students to do before the semester starts. Thank you, Alison. Um, I'm Neetu Kaushik. I'm assistant professor of economics in social science department. So it was a great experience um, um, having facilitated that workshop. And I'm going to discuss some of the key takeaways. Uh, so as far as pre-work is concerned, uh, according to AQ, they suggest some advanced preparation to make your course more inclusive and more engaging. So some of the things that you uh, might want to look at uh, before you release your course, such as your syllabus, course design, keeping the UDL principles in mind, universal design for learning, and also the office hours. As far as inclusive syllabus is concerned, as we know that syllabus is the, the very first thing that we discuss in our class, in our very first class. And that is the first thing students look at and read uh, about the course. So it can have a long and lasting uh, effects on the students. And many of us are concerned that students don't read their syllabus or they don't read it carefully. So how we can address those concerns? So if we adopt some of the UDL principles, universal design for learning principles, we can actually develop you know, a syllabus uh, that can help us in developing a high quality relationship with our students. And we are going to discuss some of those principles. So one of the things that ACUE, AQ, uh, suggests that syllabus, you know, we want to keep it more learning focused rather than content focused. The reason for that is that it keeps the student more motivated and engaging. And also uh, avoid any kind of hidden curriculum because it can affect students and it can have a negative impact on student learning experience it will be a good idea to read the syllabus through the student's eyes, or maybe have one of your colleague or your friend or your family member read the syllabus and ask their opinion, you know, what they think about it, whether it is clear, it is more welcoming. So those kind of things. So when you develop your syllabus, AQ suggests that, think about some of the questions. Are you addressing that who are you in your syllabus? Uh, who are we? Because in a class, the instructor and the students are a team. So are we having that team kind of environment? Are we uh, giving them the message that we are as a team? We are not you know, separate, we are together. And what is this course is about? Are we providing enough detail about it to make it more exciting and interesting? And how the student can be successful in a course? So those are the questions that you might consider while you develop your syllabus. Another thing that AQ want uh, to keep in mind is to illustrate, um, you know, how we how we have developed the course with variability in mind, especially because we teach in a community college, so we have diverse diverse student population. Um, so therefore, it is very important to give a signal to your students that your course is flexible, supportive, engaging, and it provides them multiple pathways to success. So it's, it's okay if they are unable to perform good in a test or an assignment, but they will get multiple opportunity to improve. So having that kind of signal in your syllabus is the first step to welcome a student. And the language that we use in the syllabus, you know, can set a stone in the beginning of the course. So we want to use a language that emphasizes a collaborative spirit and an orientation towards learning, flexibility, and possibility rather than performance and punishment. So we don't want to use the terms like, you know, punishment based or something like that. Rather, we, rather than we want to provide more clarity. For example, if you are providing explanation about your deadlines and academic honesty, make sure you mention that why it is important, why academic honesty is important, why those deadlines are there, why it is important to complete the work on those due dates. So it is, it is important to be flexible as well as you know, having deadlines and academic honesty policies and explaining it to the student why you have those policies in place. So this will have the students you know, to understand the importance of it. And also consider uh, using accessible images and visual representation of the content because students, many of our students are visual learners. 
So for example, having your grading criteria or having your course uh, tentative schedule, like you know, in a table format or having a pie chart that explains you know, the various weightages and the cri uh, grading criteria. So having those visual images can make a lot of difference. As far as universal design for learning UDL is concerned, uh, you know, you, this, uh, uh, this strategy focuses on teaching and learning methods that provides an opportunity for all students to succeed. We, want to, we don't want to leave anybody. So AQ suggests that lowering the barriers to learning for students with specific need can benefit all students. So for example, if you are ensuring that there is closed captioning or if you are recording the lectures, right? So that can not only benefit the student who needs those uh, accommodations, but it can help other students also. So those things you know, uh, that we might want to keep in mind one of the important objective of UDL is to ensure that it enriches student experience with minimal difficulties. For example, think about if the course is visually appealing and if it is easy to navigate. So for example, if the student is able to find their assignments, uh, the content or the videos that you want them to look at. So if that is easy for them to find. So you can again ask uh, you know, one of your colleague or one of your friends or family members to see if they are able to navigate, you know, if it is easy to find the find the material and other important, you know, stuff that you want them to look at. Another suggestion uh, provided by AQ is to be consistent with your presentation. For example, uh, in my courses, I have weekly modules. So in week one, I will have all the content that I want my student to look at and learn. And then I also have my assignments and uh, you know, if there is any test, everything in that module. And I named that module as week one module. And I also mentioned the dates. But some other professor, they might have a different way of presenting it. Uh, I have my colleagues, they have separate folders for assignments, um, separate folders for videos. So you can also arrange like that. But whatever you decide, it is important to be consistent because that makes it easier for students to navigate. Then also double check all the links, you know, that you have in your syllabus as well as in your content. Uh, so many times we copy the syllabus, you know, from the previous courses. So it is quite possible that some of the web link or the video link might have issues. So before you release your course, make sure to check all those links if they are, uh, if they are still working and also making sure about the closed captioning. We also suggest to provide your content in multiple format. For example, some students just like to read, some students like to watch the video to understand the material. So, uh, you know, if you can provide the material in multiple format, that would be great. And for a live class, consider recording the session because it is quite possible that there might be students who might not be able to attend those live session. So they can watch those recordings later. And it can also help the student who did attend the class, but they want to look at it again. So again, UDL principle, you know, you are helping those students who might have missed the class, but at the same time, you're also helping the student who might want to look at it again. They can pause, they can, uh, you know, revise. So that can be really helpful. So those are the, some of the suggestions, UDL, uh, according to the UDL principles. Regarding the office hours, you know, uh, office hours is a time when student can have one-to-one -one interaction with you. And it is important to remove any possible barriers. So AQ suggests uh, that, you off the, that you offer your office hours variety of times, like in the morning times or in the evening times, have a combination of that and also the length. So in an online or distance learning class, consider giving multiple options. Obviously, some student, you know, might be okay with email some student might want to talk to you over the phone or through a video call. So those options might be, you know, um, good way of communicating. So depending upon the student's resources and their living conditions, providing them those multiple options, uh, you know, is more inclusive. So providing office hours that way. And AQ also suggests offering small group meeting, meeting options because sometimes students can find it intimidating to talk to a professor one-to-one. -one. So having uh, you know, that option of meeting in small groups, like two or three students you know, meet with you during uh, the office hours. So that will be less uh, intimidating and they will be more open. And also remind your students about the office hours 
maybe you know every other class so that they know you are there for them even outside the class and um, you know try to mention your office hours as student hours because that it makes it more inclusive and student get the message that is the time for them next slide please So after you have uh, done uh, enough preparation before you release the course, the first week is also very important uh, for any course because this is something you know that student uh, help with retention, you know, reten uh, ret retention in the class. So starting strong, what does it mean? So we suggest that you provide welcoming message. I'm sure most of you are already doing it. It can be through email, announcements, videos, whichever you prefer, or you can have all of them. And also recommend, we also recommend to explaining the course expectations to the students, although it is already mentioned in the syllabus, but having that explain again in your welcoming message or video might be beneficial. Um, another suggestion we can provide you is to invite a former student, uh, you know, in your class and having them talk like five, 10 minutes so that they can let the student know, um, you know, how they can be successful in that class and what they can expect because students really like to listen from their peers. And also letting students uh, having some interaction during the first week, like having small group discussions, that way you student in an online class, they can have a community, right? Providing them some icebreaker exercises and also keeping an eye on the student attendance and participation, especially in the first, week, first few weeks, uh, because that way, you know, if students have any technical issues or having any logistic issues, you can contact the student as soon as possible. And that way you can address those concerns. As far as survey is concerned, you can also consider giving surveys to the students to know about uh, you know, their, uh, any possible barriers they might be facing, uh, such as you know, uh, the, any logistics, such as having the laptop, internet connection, uh, if they have computer, uh, camera, microphone, all those you know, uh, accessible. So those things are very important. So, and if there is any problem, then you can address those uh, issues, you know, right on time, rather than waiting too long. Then setting the tone in the beginning is also very important. Uh, it is crucial to explain the proper communication guidelines at the beginning of the course. Obviously, the language that is respectful and acknowledges student differences. And um, an instructor can also help to create awareness of multiple visible and invisible identities in the classroom. And also uh, providing a protocol of addressing tension or problematic patterns of interaction. So those are the things that we suggest. Uh, and that is what we learned in AQ uh, micros. And uh, remember student might not be aware of some of these things. Therefore, by educating them about proper communication guidelines, you might be actually helping them outside the class also. This can have a positive impact on our society. Thank you, Professor. Hi, everyone. Um, so this particular core cohort uh, in regards to uh, inclusive online learning environment uh, talked about three things, three major points here. This, this idea of that, you know, in an online environment, there are fewer physical cues um, about a student's background, uh, their identities than in a face-to-face -face setting. You know, however, um, research just suggests that implicit or unconscious biases, you know, can still be triggered simply by uh, seeing a student's name or maybe a profile picture from like the C2C or even web attendance. Uh, and that can really impact how a student is evaluated or judged. So really the first thing is, a, uh, the first step is, is the self-reflection, self right? The self-awareness, um, you know, paying attention to and acknowledging to yourself any assumptions uh, that you might have about your online students, again, based on their name or something, or even something that they've written, like if you had uh, a reflection journal, you know, the first week of the, of the semester, you know, and by bringing these thoughts to, um, you know, uh, your conscious awareness, hopefully, uh, we can sometimes somehow avoid these types of uh, assumptions. And it's going to cause you to kind of sit in some uncomfortable feelings, right, some uncomfortable space because you really are looking inward you know to seeing what you know what your implicit biases are and the second link the implicit bias test from harvard um is if you want to click on that link or 
even if we can copy and paste it in the chat. Um, this is something that the AQ um, cohort talked about in one of their videos. And it's actually really interesting. So you can take this test and you want to set aside some time. I actually didn't realize how long it would actually take. There's a series of different tests that you can take, um, essentially just really uh, learning more about yourself and any implicit biases that you may currently have. So the, um, the lesson actually um, suggested that you do this every couple of months or so, or maybe even before a semester or after a semester. Um, so that's the link there. They will put the link in the, the, in the chat space so that you can review it and maybe go through it. I, I would suggest probably spending, giving yourself about 20 or 30 minutes or so to go through. There's a lot of ser different series of, um, of different types of objectives and, and tests that you can take, but I found it really interesting. So when we talk about uh, you know microaggressions, you know these are the everyday verbal, nonverbal, environmental slights or insults um, that intentionally and hopefully unintentionally um, you know communicate really negative uh, messaging, and it's really based solely on you know the marginalized groups, you know that their membership in, in whichever marginalized group that they're in. So AQ really listed a lot of great themes. Uh, of microaggression, but for time's sake, and hopefully when we do these small breakout sessions, we can dive in a little bit further. Um, one of the themes that was um, talked about, uh, one example I should say was, you know, continuing to mispronounce the names of students after students have corrected the instructor, you know, multiple times, even going as far as suggesting a nickname, you know, I, I can't really say your name. So just you got a nickname for me, you know, like, you know, that's a, a one example or theme of microaggression that was discussed in, in that particular lesson plan. You know, so, I mean, we all here, we registered for this workshop, we've done other workshops on, on diversity and inclusion. So we have good intentions. Uh, you know, sometimes having good intentions doesn't guarantee that someone will not be negatively, you know, impacted. But just because you, you know, don't wanna cause harm, uh, it doesn't mean that your words or actions still won't hurt or offend the other person. So now that we've looked inward and, and looked at our, any implicit biases or unconscious biases that we may have, you know, how can we create this safe space in our classroom, this sense of community? It's really about building that relationship with every student. And I know that can get difficult when you have 35 plus students, but it's, it's so important to try to do that and making that connection. Um, even creating and building connections and relationships between students you know, either through group work or something like that. Um, and by doing this, it does allow the students to lean on one another, right? Uh, as resources, as support. I actually, for my um, class that I'm teaching now in this, in, in this semester, um, the, the students decided to, you know, put, do a WhatsApp group text messaging about, with the course, right? So they can quickly text each other, talk to each other. So not only are they supporting each other, but now they're building friendships, hopefully. Uh, and building relationships um, and, and being intentional, right? So being intentional and genuine about creating these types of connections. So how can you do that? These small activities like we're gonna be doing with our small breakout sessions um, and maybe where you're not necessarily discussing course content right away, maybe just to start discussing, you know, how was your weekend? What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite book? Um, again, especially if you're gonna be doing group work throughout the semester, that can really build a sense of community with with your students and with you know you and your students and with the class, um, you know course activities, uh, content, reading, showing that diverse experience perspective, you know really really increases the sense of belonging for students. Students see that there are several points of view that are similar to the student, even the person may be speaking. Maybe they just look like them. Uh, you know representation does matter. So if you go on to the next slide. So with this particular uh, cohort, I actually didn't facilitate this one, but I do have some experience with micro lecturing, being uh, um, doing some instructional design um, previous to working with, at LaGuardia. But essentially micro lecturing, micro learning is using these short videos, right? To explain key concepts or, or specific skills. Uh, and, but before you press that record button, uh, you, know, you really wanna identify your objectives, you know, create an outline. Um, and when you do this, it does make it easier to chunk the information into these standalone videos. 
uh, personally, I actually write a script out. Um, you know, I, I'll say, here's my objective. I have 30 seconds to talk to my, my talk about my objective. I'll have 15 minutes to actually present, you know, my, my material in the last five minutes or so we summarize. So having that kind of script does, it does help me and, and hopefully it can as for you as well. And, you know, these videos really need to be focused, right? And really grab the student's attention, <clears throat> excuse me. So they really should be about five to seven minutes long. Um, anything over that, you know, that's, that you're, you're gonna lose the student. Uh, and that may be difficult, right? So it's really forcing you to sit and think about, well, what do I want these students to get from this particular module, from this course? And that's hard and it may take some time. So you wanna kind of carve out some time to do that if you're really looking into uh, creating these types of micro lectures. So when we do these uh, particular recordings, we want to find ways to provide opportunity for interaction, for that process, processing, for that retrieval. So what can we do to maintain students' attention and engagement? We can include in interactive elements like the quick checks um, that I like to do, or like you can embed that in the video. You can do short graded quizzes, uh, you know, written responses. Um, a lot of like um, the publishers like McGraw Hill Connect or Cengage MindTap already do that. So that's something to think about. Um, and this is something that I actually wanna try. The skeletal outline is something that you can uh, document, you can upload alongside with your recording. And the students, as they watch the video, will fill out all the, you know, the fill in the blanks. So as they watch the video. So this is really ensuring that your students are more likely to watch the videos and engage with your content. And then it also will give you, give them a study guide as well. And then if you're maybe asking for like a recording or even some kind of a written uh, reflection, based on the lectures. I mean, essentially any, anything that you can do to hold students accountable um, and stay engaged is really something that uh, could be beneficial for, um, for you in the classroom. And before I end my section here, I wanna um, kind of say something where in one of the, the videos that are on the cohort talked about a book and I could probably put the link up a little bit later when I find it. The book is entitled 99 Tips for creating simple and sustainable educational videos by Karen Costa. And she said something that I, I find very, it hit home and I think I, I wanted to share this with you. So more than content, more than course design, you are the factor in online courses that has the greatest potential to help your students succeed, right? It's all here, it's all you guys. And, that's, and I think we know this, that's why we, we register for these types of CTL workshops and seminars. So that's how I wanted to leave it with. Thank you. Just unmute myself. So I'm going to share a little bit about the some of the strategies that were discussed for note taking. So one of the first is just to broach the subject. So with a lot of students, you know, high school may have been, you know, three months ago, but it may have been 15 years ago. So the kind of MO is to show up with a notebook and then what do students do from there and actually just discussing it up front how to take effective notes could really help the students get into a good practice and you know a few things that this can be done in a lot of different ways but stressing that you know not everything that the professor or the instructor writes on the board needs to be written down verbatim and this is kind of reinforcing um, something that Nitu said regarding if you record the videos, that's an excellent resource for students to go back to. So, you know, if you have a recording, it can be paused, students can stop to sort of absorb what's being said. But just really, you know, letting students know there is a strategy to taking notes. You want to, um, you don't want to encourage any kind of memorization but you want students to kind of take the material, process it, you know, restructure it, and then say it in their own words, and trying to encourage note-taking skills that go along those lines. If you do that right at the beginning, then students kind of come in already with a strategy on how to do that. And something, it, the last bullet point here I'm actually going to bring in right now is this focus questions. And we just heard a little bit about skeletal notes from Jen, and this is another strategy for students. You can, of course, you can make slides available if you use PowerPoint slides, but there are 
some downsides to that. Students may not actually pay attention as much if they have the slides right in front of them. Um, they may go in the opposite direction. So skeletal notes with maybe just the key goals of that particular lecture. And you can make them detailed or you can make them not too detailed. Again, for every class is different. Even you know the same class, every section is different. Um, so it's how much you want to give the students at the beginning, but this idea of focus questions, you know, what are the main goals and, you know, in your, if you use PowerPoint or even if it's a podcast, just staying, uh, stating at the very beginning, you know, the goals for today's lecture are to answer, I like to put them in the form of questions and that was also suggested, so focus questions. So our topic today is the phases of the moon and solar and lunar eclipses. That's basic, basic, basic. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to answer the question. And then, you know, question one, question two, question three, you know, what is the alignment of the sun and etc. And make them concrete questions. So there is room at the end for a student to go through that process of thinking about what was just told to them internalizing it and restructuring it so it makes sense to them. Um, I always like to tell students, you know, we're going to pause right here and can somebody answer this question in their own words? And it can be challenging, but if you start that practice early on, students may get very used to it. And that could be a section at the end of the skeletal notes. So, you know, the concept questions, the focus questions, you know, some notes in between, and then asking the student to answer the question um, in their own words. You know, it, it will be challenging, but if they get used to doing that, then it just becomes part of the note taking process. So stressing, you know, strategies for the students to use, because again, it, you know, I can repeat it a few times, but students sometimes just get a notebook and you know, they bring it to class and it's just not clear where to go from there. Um, and nowadays, I'm sure we've all seen the students have a tendency to take pictures of PowerPoint slides. So just being really clear, you know, what you expect the student to write down. Maybe they should be listening for verbal cues um, if a professor is saying, you know, now I really want you to listen to this, so write this down. You know, you can be very clear. Um, again, I, I like the word takeaway, so I can be going on and on and then say, okay, now here's the takeaway. And then students know, okay, this is an important point. And I think the, oh, the last, so incentivize. Um, this is oh, another way, you know, if you make something worth points, students may be more apt to do it. But, and it's a little bit of extra work. I haven't tried this yet, but I am curious to see how it would go. If you have students um, make a, you know, take their notes, take a picture, send it to you. And you can just, you know, it probably won't take that long. If you can just tell them, you know, this is going in the right direction, um, you know, or just give them some feedback that they'll know they're doing the correct way of taking notes. And if you do that early on, then throughout the semester, you shouldn't need to do it really too many times after that. So you could incentivize it and offer to look at the students' notes. Um, one suggestion from AQ was to provide some example notes from other students. And you know, if that's something you had been doing already, you know, you could do that. But you know, it's definitely once you, the real takeaway <laughs> from note taking is, you know, if you set the stage early on and just really let students know, you know, you're going to succeed more if you take notes and you really process your notes and review them, you know, take notes in week one. And then by week three, let's see how this all connects together. And, you know, students will pretty much have a study guide already for them. You know, you can provide a study guide for the students or st students can actually go from their notes and provide a study guide from themselves to work from. So those are a few of the um, key points from note taking. And now we'll move to Jen again. I'm oh, sorry, Nitu. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Great points, uh, Jen and Alison. So uh, a little bit about online discussion. I know we are running out of time, so I will keep it short. So two things uh, AQ suggests uh, to look at when it comes to online discussion, one of them is prompts and other is about the participation, student participation, and also instructor participation. As far as prompt is concerned, uh, AQ suggests to making sure that the prompt aligns with your instructional goals, obviously. Sometimes, you know, we also want it to be more application based, uh, having a lot of uh, real world connection, but there has to be like a balance. Sometimes, you know, because I have been teaching online you know, from past 11 or 12 years now, 
and I have noticed that sometimes students just, you know, provide some superficial, uh, you know, knowledge or experience, not really connecting with the content. So we want to ensure that the prompt that we create uh, have a balance of you know, having those real app world application as well as instructional goals. We don't want them to deviate from it and only providing superficial information, you know. We want them to get into deep and having their real discussion. Another thing um, uh, AQ suggests uh, is to consider inclusivity in, in, your, in mind because we have, as we discussed before, we have diverse student population and also make it interesting, right? So um, I teach economics. So in my macroeconomics class, you know, I would consider providing a discussion board that might be have a COVID impact on, uh, on an economy. So it could be different countries, right? In my microeconomics class, I could have uh, a discussion like that talks about uh, the impact of COVID on various industries, right? So having those, you know, multiple prompts uh, that also has diverse viewpoint options, that can make it really interesting. So those are some of the suggestions when you develop the prompts for your discussion board. Moving to the next slide. Um, so some of the suggestions that AQ provides about the participation. So when it comes to participation, it is very important uh, for the instructor to let the student know what, uh, what are their role, you know, what, what is expected from them. Uh, so if they know uh, their role clearly, then they will be able to perform better. And uh, also suggested is to let them know the importance of discussion board, why we are doing this. Sometimes students might not take it seriously. I have my experience with that. Some students think that discussion board, like it can be high stake, it can be low stake, but I suggest having some grade associated with it. Uh, it could be like low stake, you know, kind of thing, but, you know, having some grade, you know, make it, uh, student take it more seriously and also let them know why we are doing this discussion, you know, and how it can have an impact on their learning uh, experience. So those things, it is very important uh, to explain them. And AQ also suggests providing clarity about the st student expectations from the discussion, like uh, what you're expecting from them, you know, uh, that clarity is also very important and what they can expect from the instructor, you know, so having a right balance. So you don't want to dominate the discussion as an instructor, like you don't have to reply to each and every student, you know, so you, you want to be there, but at the same time, you don't want to be too dominating in the discussion board. Having the student interact with each other and uh, having a visibility as an instructor is also very important. So having a right balance of the two. And uh, when it comes to providing more clarity, you can consider having rubrics, exemplars, you know, those things can make it more clear. Uh, having a model quality post, you know, um, those things also you might consider so that students know what exactly uh, their post, uh, you know, um, they might consider like uh, what exactly they are looking at and how they can make sure that they are providing a quality post. They don't want to have the same post, but you know, just to make sure they know, uh, you know, what are the things they should keep in mind uh, when they develop and post their post. And also having student to student interaction, that is also very important. Uh, in having the student understand why it is important to interact with other students, just like in, you know, you know, in person class when we are having discussions, you know, uh, when the student interact with each other, you know, that provides a learning community. So we want to develop the same thing in an online class. So that's why student to student interaction is also very important. So that participation, explaining the reasoning and explaining the roles, explaining the expectations, those things uh, can really help you to make your online discussion successful. Great, thank you, Nitu. And this is actually our last of the six categories before we get into the breakout rooms. So this is um, about how to provide the most useful feedback to your students. And one tip straight off the bat is to individualize it. So if and, you know, there's lots of different ways and a lot of them are discipline dependent of giving feedback. You know, an English professor may put feedback directly into a paper. Um, it could be different, um, but no matter what the form, you know, on the, let's say the feedback is from Blackboard in the feature where you can actually type in feedback. You know, something as simple as you know, saying, instead of just saying, nice job, you know, exclamation points, instead saying like, you know, 
hi, Derek, you did a really great job on this. And then to even be very more specific, if you do this, especially, and that's going to be the next point early on, then the students are much more likely to stay engaged if they know that you are actually taking the time to read that work, that you care about them. So individualizing it in whatever way makes sense for um, your particular discipline, your subject. And in terms of timely, um, you know, it's something you can set in your syllabus um, in terms of when feedback will be returned, you know, and be realistic if you know you're not going to be able to do it, you know, the next night and really <laughs> few of us are able to do that. You know, say, I will always have your feedback in one week. And then if you can't stick to that, tell, you know, the students individually, you know, that it's going to be a little bit late, but try to stick with it. And really the big you know, suggestion through AQ was the more early you can provide, so more sooner is going to have a much, much greater impact. If you spend the time, particularly on that individualized feedback early on and make it very detailed, then students will stay engaged. They're going to know that you care about them. You're reading their, you're reading their work and your feedback is helping them to succeed. And in the feedback, so strengths and specifically ways to improve. So sometimes when we see the word strengths and after that is the word weaknesses. But instead of saying these are the weaknesses, you know, first point out the good things because almost always there's something, you know, a strength that can be pointed out and then, you know, go on that, you know, however, I think these are some ways that you can improve. And you could be very specific if you use a rubric for your grading where you very specifically have laid out you know for an excellent you know you have your dimensions to get you know the full say it's worth five points to get the full five points you must do this this and this once i mean it takes some time to set those up but it, they really really um pay back in spades once you do them so you can be specific with the students like if you go back to the rubric point two right now you're only at two points but if you want to get it up to four or five just make sure you do you know point you know b and point c in this one so it can be, and that makes it also actionable. If there's, you know, vague comments as, you know, sometimes the student just wants to see some positive feedback, but to help the students succeed, you know, suggesting that they do these things. And if you're in a class where a written paper is required, I know revisions are pretty common to begin with, but allowing maybe some low stakes or even, you know, revisions where there will be no kind of penalty. So you can provide feedback and then the student will work on it. Um, and all of this is kind of, you know, the more, the earlier the students know that you are you know, really reading their reading their work, you're they're taking the time to do this, you're taking the time to help them, it really should be a way to keep them engaged. So those were some of the takeaways just on giving feedback. And we can certainly discuss more of these because I think we're gonna prepare to go into the breakout rooms now. Um, Jen or need to do you want to just briefly review the questions for the breakout rooms? Uh, sure, I'll, uh, I'll start. I guess I could start the first one. So uh, the first um, discussion is based on your distance learning experiences, you know, what preparations will you make or maybe have you made in the past or in the in recent semester or two uh, in order to have an engaging and inclusive class? And yes, yeah, so the second question, uh, what goals do you have for the discussion forum prompts you create? How do you share your expectation for student participation in course discussion forums? Great. And so I think maybe what makes sense before Oscar puts us into the breakout rooms, maybe I'll paste those into the chat so they'll still be available for you once, once we get into the breakout rooms. Let me just I can stop sharing. Go to the chat. And they're going to be arbitrary breakout rooms. I don't think there's going to be any intention of trying to create them discipline specific. So these are also with these discussion prompts were designed to be as general as possible. And just to know also, um, me too, Allison, myself, We'll kind of be, uh, you know, going in, in between the rooms, uh, interjecting or just kind of listening in on the conversations. 
um, and hopefully getting you know some good feedback on on some of the things that you will want to try to do or maybe you have done and you want to share those experiences with your colleagues. Um, so yeah, I hope that was was productive and interesting. It would be great to hear um, from someone um, from each of the groups and or you know maybe even a couple of people. Um, interested to hear what came up. Any takeaways? Speaking of, speaking of Allison's favorite word, uh, even before she said that, I was going to ask you about takeaways and if you had any from today's presentations and or your discussions, things that you think you might want to try with your students. Um, anybody want to jump in? From, Albert's raising his hand. Is it Albert? Okay. Uh, I think one thing I've learned from my colleagues in the break room was how to manage my uh, how to manage my uh, my office hours, how to become very flexible uh, during this uh, period of pandemic coronavirus, because the students that we were working with had different breeds. Uh, and uh, it's just a survival uh, situation in which we are. So we, uh, I have to try to be more understanding and support my students uh, the best way I can. And I think I've learned a lot from my colleagues during the discussion, and I'm going to try to implement this uh, in this uh, coming uh, spring term. And uh, I'm trying to reinforce it and uh, see what I can, we can come up with. Uh, in terms of uh, the first week, I think it's very important to have my syllabus, everything posted on the blackboard, uh, set up all the schedule, the first week up to the 12th week, and make sure that the step-by-step, -step, week by week, what we're covering in the classroom. And again, I mentioned to my colleagues that I was a multi multilingual, speak French fluently, taught in France and speak Spanish fluently. And of course, I speak English. And uh, so that we help me enormously. Uh, beside my accent, though I have a little accent uh, in the background, I know that. So my first thing I ask them is, uh, is anybody has a problem with my accent? Or well, they say, no, you speak very well, like uh, you're from the Middle West. I say, oh, great, I didn't know that. So uh, we try to work in a very friendly environment during my presentation, my PowerPoint presentation and everything, and try to help them making up the exams and trying to have a review sessions, review sheets, everything I can do in my, uh, my teaching instructions uh, to make sure that the students uh, make them amenable. And this can be whether they will like it, the chemistry that I'm teaching, which is they're most of the time afraid of, but I try to make it very, very personal and see the many, the multi applications that we have in the science of, the science of chemistry such as the nursing, medicine, uh, of course, the pandemic we're having right now, the research and everything, and make it personal to touch the realistic, touch their lives that we're in all these together. And we have to try to do everything possible to survive. Uh, so thank I, you, to thank my colleagues. I thank my colleagues thank for all the, everything they did for me. And I'm very appreciative. That's, that's wonderful. Albert, thank you so much for that. I, and I, I especially love what you said about the being flexible with the office hours. The other day, I went to a presentation that uh, two of your colleagues who are facilitating here today that, that Nitu and Jen did, and I believe it was Nitu who mentioned, and she said it today also, she doesn't call them office hours anymore. She calls them student hours. Okay. And, and the other day she said, that's like because that. some students think when they hear office hours that it means the professor is going to go and, and spend time in their office and you shouldn't interrupt them. Okay. So I thought that was a great example of how it can be easy to think that people, students understand what you're talking about, but they may not understand certain terms that you're using. 
So to say student hours, it's very clear that these hours are dedicated this time, this is your time that's dedicated to the student. So I, I think it's great that you are willing to be flexible with that. Does anyone else have a takeaway that they'd like to share? Priscilla, I can say something if that's okay. Uh, I'm not sure if it was expressly said here, but in a variety of these online um, teaching excellence courses I've been taking, I think that what I've taken away most is that you cannot give the students enough opportunities to get the information. And at times I wonder how, how many times can I say this? So I send a weekly announcement, I forward it to their email, I have it in their weekly course materials. But even though it seems redundant to me, there are there's students that cling to certain places in Blackboard or certain type, you know, areas of the course. And when the material is there and easy to find, it just makes that stress level go away. So if I have to cut and paste in a numerous places in Blackboard, it seems to be, yeah, overdoing it, absolutely. It seems to be overdoing it for me because I wrote the course and I know where it is. But for students, they appreciate wherever they look, finding information. And if I can take that layer of stress away in these times that I think I'm doing at least a service for them. Great point. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, that's so important. Feel free to jump in anyone if you have any anything you heard today that you are considering trying or maybe questions about something. Um, I'll, I'll jump in and just add something that wasn't actually discussed in either the big or the breakout group, but was in the AQ class. And it was um, about sketch noting, which I didn't really know about. It's like, you know, justifying doodling in a sense, but it's a way of taking notes, but using visuals. And I have found that as uh, something to build into for my students that they really like because it's, it's a different way to think about it. And I actually share my office with my grandson who's in kindergarten. And he always says, you don't draw enough in class. And <laughs> so I made the connection between sketch noting and how we learn to communicate as small children. And it made a lot of sense. And so I've sort of brought that back in and the students love it. And it's something different than we normally do in class at this level. So um, I'll just make a pitch for that. And I'll type in the word. Oh, thank you, Martina. That, I mean, I, I say any justification for doodling works for me personally, but I, I love the idea because you're also kind of welcoming creativity and different approaches to remembering things. And I think it opens it up in kind of a playful and inviting way. So, so thank you so much. Um, Sketch noting is the official term. Okay, if, if you have any handy examples you wanna show us, by all means, feel free. Just one, I see you Albert, but I wanna give the chance to some other folks if they wanna jump in. Do you mind if we just, if we get into, if, the, if anyone else is, just thinking, germinating some ideas. Please, Paul. The uh, interesting things I heard in our group was, um, and maybe a lot of folks do this already, but, but um, putting the students in breakout rooms in Zoom. And um, what what uh, came up was that the uh, in their smaller breakout rooms, students seem a little more willing to turn on the cameras because I know that very often you're looking at a, a sea of black screens. So I thought that was that was interesting. And we talked a lot also about uh, managing discussion groups and how to really get more of a uh, response and discussion. That was a bit, that was that was really interesting uh, as well. So great, thank you for that. Did you any specifics around the discussion group? Um, well, one of the things, yes, uh, I think Nitu talked about uh, having them, you know, assigning them, they have to respond, but it was twice a week. Last time when I taught an online course, which was about three or four years ago, everybody was online doing all their work Sunday night. And of course then, so by having them have to respond once earlier, 
is sort of enough time in between for the second response and response back. So uh, sort of like spacing that, I think that was, you know, that was kind of helpful. Interesting. I didn't take the AQ course, although I tried to, and I took the first module, but I heard feedback from different colleagues around the campus and, and several people pointed out that they really liked the way the AQ course integrated the short mini videos lectures with the discussion board. And I don't, I think that might partly be because of Canvas. They use the Canvas platform, they don't have Blackboard and it might be a little bit easier to do it visually in Canvas. Um, you got you AQ folks can correct me if I'm wrong, but that seemed like a very powerful way of having those components integrated it. And it's such a simple, basic thing, but it makes so much sense. I wish we could, and maybe, maybe other people have also found better ways of doing that, even using Blackboard or different platforms. Yeah, just to very quickly add in, you can um, do recordings for your students. We talked about it a bit in our breakout room. Um, also, just another thing I meant to mention this with feedback, um, even in Blackboard, which I think a lot of us are still using, when you're giving feedback, there is a way you can make it video feedback, so even more personal, um, or just audio. You know, sometimes it doesn't need to be video, it can be audio. So that's definitely a powerful, you know, another way of communicating with students in a very engaging way. That's in Blackboard, Allison, you can give yeah. video feedback. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, if anybody ever wants more to. audio feedback, that's great to know. That's really great to know. Yeah, I think it's in the same section as you would type, the, you know, text your feedback. There's an option there, you know, to record something as well. And again, oh, just to break yeah. it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As we're winding down, because we're coming to the end of the our time is are there any last comments or questions or things that anyone would like to share requests i thought this was a great course so thank you for sharing and following up i learned a lot thank you gretel and you're talking about the aq and you are participating aq and and this you know kind of right before the semester starts again refresher course oh good it's good well, yeah i agree with gretel it is good for the beginning of the new semester so good well thank you so much i'm really thank glad you. you were able to join us today also there's another workshop on march 1st about preparing specifically on preparing for the first day of class so Please sign up for that if you haven't yet. And Albert, you had another question? No, no, thank you very much. And, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank I learned you. a lot. Thank I learned you. tremendously, yes. All right. Well, take care, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.